Um, David Goodman's Best Backcountry Skiing in the Northeast, a classic, just got a, a, a new edition, uh, came out. And uh, Snow Pit Technology is one of my favorite field books to use when I am traveling in the backcountry. Uh, we have Al Mandel joining us tonight. Al is a longtime ski guide and avalanche educator. He uh, currently works for Acadia Mountain Guides and he runs trips not only here in the Northeast on Mount Washington, but he uh, travels across the globe, uh, does a lot of stuff in Japan and uh, is certainly a wealth of knowledge and we're really excited to have Al here joining us. Uh, he's got a, an engineering background as well. So there's a lot going on upstairs with Al and he's got a uh, teaching style that I think all of you are gonna benefit from tonight. So thanks everybody for joining. I'm sure there'll be a, a few people trickle, trickle get rolling here and Al, maybe if I missed anything, feel free to um, feel free to continue your introduction before you dive into your presentation. Screen share here. And you can go ahead, Al, and share. I will in one second. I uh, will say while we're getting set up here too, if you have any questions for Al, uh, we will be able to take those live tonight. So, and we'd encourage people to um, ask any questions. But chances are, if you have a question, somebody else has a similar or the same question. So uh, the easiest thing for us is if you use the Q and A box and we can, we can get to those. And then we'll also be able to take some live questions at the end, if, if uh, people wanna use the hand raise feature at the end of Al's talk, we can, uh, we can give you a heads up when we're ready for that. And All right. Al, whenever you're, whenever you're ready. Sounds good. So good evening, everybody. Um, we're psyched that you're here. We're psyched that you're attending our community outreach services and, and talks. Um, tonight's talk is, uh, from Glade to Gate, all right, which is avalanche awareness for the Eastern skier going out of Western gates, all right. So a quick, Pat handled the intro pretty well for me. Uh, um, so as a longtime ski guide, I'm also part of the area instructor team um, and an AMGA apprentice ski guide. Pat listed the various places. There's also a lot of Iceland, Greenland, soon to be Kyrgyzstan. Um, I've also skied every major European high route. Um, and I'm really giving this talk tonight because this is my roots, all right? Uh, um, in the late 80s and mid 90s with no AVI rescue gear, uh, no idea where I was going and no real plan, um, I began going out of gates or ducking ropes at major Western ski areas. And as I learned more and more, I realized how crazy an idea it was. It, also triggering a variety of avalanches in the process. So we're gonna to talk to you about the East. We're gonna to talk to you about the West. We're gonna talk avalanche awareness and mix it all together. So if you do decide to go out of gates out West, you'll do it as safely as possible. So when I think about lift served backcountry skiing, all right, like East versus West. On the East Coast, it's really not, there's no real, avalanche terrain, all right? It's not typically in avalanche terrain. Our primary hazards here are really hitting trees and getting lost. There's a very low probability overall of getting caught in an avalanche. And there's very few lift served avalanche fatalities or accidents in the East Coast. The West, you know, in contrast, gates enter into unmanaged avalanche terrain. Routes can expose skiers to unknown avalanche and terrain hazards, major cliffs, et cetera. Getting caught in avalanches has a much higher probability. And there's a ton of lift served avalanche fatalities in the East. The reason I'm using the term lift served, like lift served backcountry skiing versus side country is, it's really not side country. It's lift served backcountry skiing. And so when you think about it that way, then you'll begin to think of it more as some of the dangers in it versus, hey, it's just ducking this rope here, all right? So now we're gonna talk some of our favorite areas on the East Coast. So 
Jade Day can provide one of the best powder days ever. Truly epic days. Certain J days stick in my mind because they were just simply that good, like skiing out to my car in a foot of snow after it snowed massively. All right. Nonetheless, it's not really avalanche terrain. So in Pat's thanking the sponsors section, he talked about Altopo, which is a major mapping program that all of us use all the time to view terrain, to tour plan that terrain, et cetera. So as I look at Jay here in the Green Mountain Flyer or freezer for those who ski a lot of Jay and the tram, we see there's really not a lot of avalanche terrain here, all right? Even when you, you pop this over to Big J, you'll see that. So yet you're riding this terrain, having a great time. So, so the take home really is, hey, we can ride terrain that is an avalanche terrain and still have incredible times, all right? So when I go to, to Sugar Bush or, or the bush as it, it it's often called, this was my home hill for 20 years. Went to high school here. I did my undergrad down the road at Middlebury. It has great terrain, both in the Slide Brook Basin as well as on the backside that drops to Route 17. Although more heavy terrain than Jay, it's heavily forested as you can see through here. This is kind of the zone in between the Heaven's Gate lift and the Castle Rock lift. So some heavy terrain here, it's all really forested. So the potential of, of exposing yourself to hazards other than hitting trees and getting lost is just not really in that kind of terrain. There's not, there's really no active avalanches here. Um, and in my 20 years, I certainly never saw avalanches in here. All right. So for some, Stowe really has some of the East's best lift serve backcountry. The highest points on Mount Mansfield feature some great skiing. You can see them here. Lines directly off the chin, lines like profanity. Uh, and lines in the notch are things of Eastern lore. But avalanches are relatively uncommon here. Yes, a skier from Meathead Films triggered an avalanche and perished due to trauma. And yes, the notch does slide, as evidenced by the slide by the Winter Warfare School. But overall, avalanche activity in this zone is pretty rare. Now we go to Pat's Home Hill, all right? So Sugarloaf, which is just a dynamite ski area, all right? This above tree line terrain, et cetera, great stuff. And as Pat's a homer for the loaf, just like I am for the bush, because I'm a Gumby, as a CVA guide, he probably knows what a Gumby is. But the bottom line for loafers is there's really minimal avalanche terrain here if you're looking around at it, all right? It doesn't mean the loaf does not ski steep and in your face, because it absolutely does. But it just means you can get to the stoke again without venturing into avalanche terrain, all right? Now, I'm gonna switch the gears up. So this is Vale. This, is, this hike here is off the Mongolia Palm, I'm a lift. It's a 15 minute, pretty much ridge line hike out to this terrain is known as East Vale Chutes, which are a super deadly area, all right? Well, as Easterners, when we get on airplanes, all this changes a duck in the rope for some pow shots outside of one of our areas. With the epic icon, arm wrestling match that's going on right now. More Eastern skiers have lift ticket privilege at Western Resorts, which brings more skiers with limited experience with avalanche terrain jumping outside of the gates because the ski of, uh, they ski out of bounds on the East Coast, all right? This can be a ticket to a big ride, or, or as Nick Asinet Mountain Guides often says, a free lesson in the back country. So that brings me to this enticing terrain of East Vale Chutes that I mentioned, just a 15 minute walk out of the ski area, all right? All this is incredible skiing. And as you drive into Vale, you're gonna look at this terrain on the left side of the road as you're coming in on I-70. It's gonna speak to you, especially if you're gonna be skiing, skiing there, because you're gonna be seeing skiers on the road, on the highway, hitching back into Vale, all right? So this is a really popular route. I think the record for laps in here was by a skier who cranked five laps in a day. All right, so there's a lot, ton of terrain. There's great powder skiing in here, but this is some deadly stuff.
Whoa. That wasn't expected. So we see that, that that skier took a pretty big ride, all right? For years, I always thought like old growth, big trees, it really didn't go. Then I started to kick some storm slab avalanches off in those trees. Then I saw some brutally big avalanches in the trees. And I realized that uh, this idea of trees always being anchors was not so much the case. It's often true with hard slabs but not really for soft slabs. So there's a pretty big ride by Austin in these fail shoots. He drops a 50 foot cliff during that avalanche. And when we back up to that terrain later on, you'll see how it's just riddled with cliffs. So great skiing, a lot of fun, super dangerous, super deadly. So now another popular spot to pop out to, Tahoe. So Here's a gate at Squaw and Alpine Meadows, right off top of the KT-22 chair. For many of you, you may, maybe KT-22 sticks in your mind, but this is really the original home of Shane McConkie. Um, and a lot of huge skiers have made a name for themselves. Cody Townsend, dropping the cliffs at KT-22. That's just inbound Squaw. The minute we walk out of this gate, we can get into the Granite Chief Wilderness over here, all this avalanche terrain in here, all right? So if you're grabbing that gate, make sure you read the bulletin and know what aspects the avalanche problem is on. Not familiar with that? We'll talk about it later in the talk. So now one of my total favorites is Mount Baker, the shucks and arm, all right? This is, is just giant terrain, as we can see here. You see my yellow arrow. This might be a five minute walk off of this top of this chair. It might be 70 or 80 vertical feet. So this is really easy access terrain. You're watching it all from along this chair eight here. And you're seeing all kinds of lines being skied off the arm. All right, so your desire when you get on to Baker, which, you know, it, it, in case you don't remember, Baker's known for the largest snow total in the country in a single season, over a thousand inches. So this place is home of big powder days and, and kind of like, um, I'll say in, uh, an East Coast version of J, all right, Baker serves up powder days that will stick in your mind forever. All right, so huge terrain off here. You're looking out on the arm right here. And this, you're actually seeing the skier triggering an avalanche in here. And there's a pretty big backstory to this, this avalanche trigger. So this was actually for a magazine shot and the skier and the photographer discussed this whole route. And, and if an avalanche happened, what they would do, would you use an airbag, et cetera. So, so both the photographer and the skier knew the situation that, that was there. And indeed the skier did trigger an avalanche, but the skier was able to ski out of it, all right? For most of us, these coasters were very, very rarely in avalanches. And so the concept of being able to ski out of them is not a skill set we've really developed. I'm not saying people develop that skill set and then have it in their wheelhouse. Do not think that. But many of you have seen a lot of the ski porn that I'll call it of like T 
TGR and MSP, et cetera. And you'll see skiers ski out of avalanches. Remember, they're pro skiers. They're in big terrain all the time. And there's all kinds of IFMGA guides hanging out, watching that action and ready to pounce. So, so the point is, the terrain here at Baker, fantastic stuff, uber dangerous. So just be cautious if you're jump walking out to the shucks and arm off chair eight in Baker. We're gonna show you a little bit of that terrain here. You have to go with the music, it's not mine, it's the rider. But you just see how big the terrain on the arm is here. This is the top of shucks. So big terrain at Baker, looks great, is great. I've had numerous opportunities to ski it, but just recognize that's some dangerous avalanche, avalanche prone terrain. So now we'll go to Alta. Everybody dreams of skiing at Alta. Uh, um, and um, this is really where I, I, it's, I carefully use the term cut my teeth in my Western rope ducking. In about the mid 80s, uh, while Alta was still a cash only resort uh, um, and lift tickets were 14 bucks, um, this is the top of the Wildcat lift. And so you can drop into Snowbird through this terrain. Now there's a run here or a line, it's called the Keyhole. But really back then it wasn't skied too often. And so as my buddies and I were driving up from the bird into Alta on a huge powder day, it was our idea that, yeah, end of the day, we'll drop this line. We'll just duck that rope and dive into Snowbird. When I think about that now, I think about how crazy it is. First of all, I didn't have any Cal Topo. No idea of slope angle in here. No idea really, I knew the aspect, but no idea to look at the Utah Avalanche Center's website and get an idea if there was an avalanche bulletin. Avi gear didn't really use it, all right? Wasn't really all that great during that time. Uh, um, I'm sure there's some, those listening, maybe Mark Renson, who uh, will tell me about the, how great the Ortovox F1 is with the earpiece analog beacon. But basically when I use those beacons, they were pretty clueless to me. I really didn't understand how they worked and I never was really any good at them. But the net take home here is there's this terrain all outside of this area and it's giant avalanche terrain. It's being skied all the time. So it's super enticing to us, all right? So how do we do it? We ride with avalanche rescue gear, all right? You can probe, shovel, if you can afford it, especially in that Western terrain, airbag. Airbags are less common on the East Coast and the debate will always be there of whether they're the right safety tool for the East or not. 
by no means is an airbag really a safety tool. It's a bailout tool, all right? You got in an avalanche and you're pulling the ripcord and hoping. Does it always work? Well, some of you have seen a video called Know Before You Go, where a pro skier, Amy Engelbretson, gets caught in an avalanche right outside of Alta. The current Stowe skier, Aaron Rice, ultimately rescued her. She had her airbag on. She was buried four feet deep and it was deployed. A friend of mine a few years ago was killed in an Alta avalanche and um, also had his airbag on, also buried four feet deep with the airbag deployed. So an airbag is no get out of jail free card, but it is something that in the right terrain can be the difference, may be the difference in you surviving or not. The bottom line is whenever you're going into avalanche terrain, you need to have avalanche rescue gear, meaning beacon, probe, shovel. If you can get an airbag, it's a great thing to have. Get the avalanche bulletin for your zone. It's one click away. So this is avalanche.org. You can just pop this onto your phone, grab the avalanche report for anywhere in the country. It's select, it's clickable, one click away. So there's no real reason if you're gonna ride out west and potentially go out of these gates, let alone be ski touring, that you're not on the avalanche website for your zone. So how do we look at this when we're riding it and we wanna ride it safely? The first thing we need to remember as skiers is the five point danger rating, all right? Low, moderate, considerable, high, and extreme. The thing that should be sending off alarm bells when you look at the avalanche bulletin is that most accidents occur during considerable and moderate. Is this some of the best skiing? Can be. The minute I see that on the bulletin, it goes off in my head that most accidents occur here. And so I really need to be paying attention. If I don't understand what's going on, then I need to seek mellower terrain when this is going on. We all know recently we had high avalanche danger. We also know we had a couple of skiers caught in an avalanche without rescue gear. So the key point there, get some rescue gear, look at the avalanche bulletin and recognize a considerable and moderate avalanche danger are places that people get hurt and killed. That scale is not linear, it's logarithmic. So as you're ramping up between moderate skier triggered avalanches possible, and considerable skier triggered avalanches likely. This is an exponential or logarithmic rate here. In considerable skier triggered avalanches are likely, meaning you're most likely the trigger. If you listen to Bruce Tremper in Staying Alive in Avalanche Terrain, he'll tell you about that in 90% of the time, someone in the group triggers the avalanche, all right? So when we think about recreating in considerable avalanche danger, recognize it's probably our group, someone in our group that's gonna bring it down. So let's dig into how to read an avalanche bulletin, all right? So we're prepared to get out there. Avalanche bulletins, first of all, show us the danger rating, again, the five point danger scale from an elevation based forecast in many forecast centers. So down here below tree line, danger on this one is low. Here at the middle elevation or near tree line, it's moderate, skier trigger to avalanche is possible. And the upper elevations above tree line, considerable. Other icons will show it to you via a compass rose. So in this, the small part here represents our upper elevation or you know, above tree line. And what we see here is it's considerable on northwest, north, northeast, and east aspects. It's moderate danger on the other aspects. This is above tree line. At tree line, it's also considerable, northwest, north, northeast, and east, all right? 
So here's a couple different ways that different avalanche centers represent the danger. Know the avalanche problem that you're dealing with, all right? Avalanche problems there's, have different tools to assess them. And so if we pull out the wrong tool, no different than pulling out the wrong tool when we're working on our house, um, things never tend to really go very well. So make sure you understand what kind of avalanche problem you're dealing with. When we talk avalanche problem, what you'll see is the type of avalanche problem, all right? This icon represents wind slab or problem type. And you'll get the aspect and elevation where the problem lies. So for this wind slab, this was from our own avalanche center. We see it was on north, northwest, west, southwest, south, and southeast faces at all elevations. Really the only place to safely ride in those situations can be in the northeast and eastern. Then we get the likelihood that the forecaster thinks it will be, all right? Here, it's almost certain. So this is a, a high avalanche danger day. And then we get to size, small to large. Very large D3, historic four and five. I never get into the destructive potential, which is the D scale, very much past D2, because D2 is defined as can injure, bury, or kill me. At the point the avalanche can injure, bury, or kill me, I don't need to know how big it's gonna be. I just know that I can get pretty messed up in it. So again, remember the avalanche problem, know where it's located from an aspect on the compass and elevation, likelihood forecaster feels, and then the size. Typically the forecaster will give you a variety of sentences here, which is kind of the big picture, all right? But there's more to an avalanche bulletin than just getting the danger rating as well as the avalanche problem. Talk about that in a second. So there's nine different types of avalanches, all right? Not all nine will ever be in play on a single day. If they were, go to brunch. Um, these are our types. These are the various types. So get used to recognizing the icons. All right, wind slab, storm slab. This is a loose avalanche, loose dry. It's a loose wet avalanche, a wet slab. A persistent slab avalanche, noted by this persistent layer sitting here that's been grayed out. A deep persistent slab, a cornice avalanche, a glide crack. Wind slab avalanches are the type that are most common. A, a mentor of mine a, a long time ago said, show me the mountain range that there's no blowing wind because I want to move there. And, and it's such an interesting point because it seems almost everywhere where there's snow and mountains, there's wind. The most dangerous type are these persistent layers, all right? So just realize that when you see a persistent slab on your forecast, you've really got a very tough avalanche problem. Read the forecaster's thoughts, all right? So you've got the basics of the forecast, which are the elevation-based danger rating, where the avalanche problem lies, how touchy it is or the likelihood, and then how big it is. But here's really where the forecasters are giving us their thoughts. There's way more in this section. So typically take the time to read through this section and understand what the forecasters are talking about. Understand the trends over the next days. All right, so what we see here again in, with this whole idea of how your forecast is given to you, below tree line, tree line, and then the alpine. So we see here that it's high and considerable at this elevation and moderate. That's the Tuesday rating. Wednesday ratings start to change some, all right? So understand trends when you're going out. Take an avalanche course, all right? This is one of the biggest things you can do to keep yourself safe, both locally at home here when you're skiing within the presidentials and our other avalanche terrain like Katahdin, 
or in years when we get to go up to the Chick Shocks, but take an avalanche course. Throughout the valley, there's numerous providers for avalanche courses. There's Acadia Mountain Guides who I work for. There's Sinnet Mountain Guides. There's Northeastern Mountaineering. There's uh, Mark Chauvin or Chauvin International. It's also taught um, EMS Outdoor School. So there's ample opportunities to take an avalanche course in the valley, take an avalanche course. So kind of summarizing how do you keep safe there? It's get avalanche gear, beacon probe and shovel, read the forecast, and then deep dive with a professional instructor and take an avalanche course. As we think about different regions, back to from glade to gate, all right, different parts of the country have different types of snowpacks. Different snowpacks have different kind of avalanche types, as well as how the danger rating and snowpack react to the different loadings, all right? So a maritime snowpack is a deep snowpack and a warm snowpack. That's Washington, California, and Oregon. They tend to rise fast and fall fast. If you're thinking about looking at your Epic or your Icon Pass to see where it's good, it could be Crystal, it could be Baker, it could be Tahoe, any of those spots. The reason it rises fast and falls fast is because it's huge snow loads. I've seen Baker reports that five to nine feet was projected for the storm cycle they were in. Now think about a five to nine foot dump. That's just huge amounts of snow. And, and so when that kind of snow hits and it's, it's, a, it's a warmer, you know, little wet or high SWE or snow water equivalent, high moisture snow, it just avalanches out because it's all this huge load and that load sloughs itself and there's a lot of naturals. And that causes the danger to rise instantly with the big dump and that ultimately fall fast as that dump settles out in avalanches. An inner mountain snowpack, which is shallow and cold at first and deeper later, is the snowpack that's Utah, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. This will rise fast, again with the decent storms, but it falls slower. The reason it's shallow and cold first, this is kind of what's called continental snowpack, all right? So where we have shallow and cold early in the season, creating some persistent layers. Then it's deeper later on. Often you can get deep enough, these early bad layers that form aren't as in play as much. But the key thing to remember here is rises fast with storms, falls a little slower, as in multiple days, four or five days, et cetera. Continental snowpack. This is really a Colorado kind of snowpack, all right? It's characterized by shallow snow totals and cold nights, similar to nights we have here in, in the New England area, all right? It's slow to rise because it just doesn't get those big dumps that Inner Mountain and Maritime gets, but it's very slow to fall because it's the home of persistent slab, all right? Which we'll talk about here in a moment. So just remember, if you're going out of the gates in Colorado, Big time avalanche danger due to persistent layers. Maritime snowpacks, you can go out of those gates a little sooner. Inner mountain gates, you need to wait some more days to get out of those. As I said, the continental snowpack with its persistent slab is typically the most dangerous. So just remembering the persistent slab icon recognizing that persistent slab, deep persistent slab. Think of those two really as, you know, persistent slab, kind of a standard New England IPA, deep persistent slab, a double or triple IPA. These two types of avalanches account for 70% of fatalities. So again, boom, you open up the bulletin if you're skiing Colorado or wherever you're skiing, you see persistent slab in the forecaster's avalanche problem, and we recognize, wow, 70% of fatalities occur here. So when we combine that with the danger rating, remember the five-point danger rating, we have moderate and considerable, where about 63% of avalanche accidents happen, 
and deep persistence, persistent slab and deep persistent slab where 70% of fatalities occur. So if you're walking into going out of a gate where there's persistent slab and deep persistent slab, and it's a moderate or considerable day, you are staring down the barrel of a gun. So let's talk about the snowpack right now in the US. So for Colorado, this is from the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, all right? That's the CAIC, all right? And down below, I've got the link for it. So right now, what we see, this is today's danger rating, is the whole state is a hotbed for human triggered avalanche and natural avalanche. All the orange represented as considerable, meaning skier triggered avalanche likely. The red zones, Vale Summit, Aspen, the Gunnison area, those are all in high danger. It means natural avalanches likely. This is some dangerous skiing in the state right now. So be cautious, spend your time in simple avalanche terrain or just ride the lifts and stay in bounds right now. Oh, that would be the Sierra Avalanche Center, all right? That's what, there's who they are. You see the link at the bottom of the talk. This is loaded with terrain in here. All your major Tahoe areas are part of this avalanche center. What's the danger rating? Considerable. Skier triggered avalanche is likely again. So how's that Tahoe snow right now? Usually kind of stable, not too stable at the moment. Let's jump to Utah. It's a quick, easy flight out of Boston or New York, usually a direct flight. You can ski to Bird or Alta, leave in the morning. You can be on it. You can be on the hill by noon or one o'clock. How's the snow shaping up in Utah? All of it's inconsiderable until we get on here where it's moderate. Here the snow is low enough that we're not doing a, a regular five point danger rating forecast. Wanna pop to Salt Lake right now? A lot of persistent problems. Be very careful if you're gonna go out of the gates at Snowbird, at Brighton, at Solitude, or at Alta. And finally for Washington. So this is the Northwest Avalanche Center, NWAC. NWAC is a great place to kind of data mine along with the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. Those are two just fantastic websites of just deep information. I really encourage everybody to spend time on either one or both to really understand the wealth of information that, that, that they put out there. But again, the Washington forecast, all pretty much sitting at considerable. Baker up here, you've got Crystal, Snoqualmie, that area here, Stevens Pass, all this. So Washington, pretty dangerous. So as we are thinking glade to, glade to gate right now, and, and we're thinking that we might wanna get in a plane or get in our camper van or get in our car and drive out west, we've got a pretty dangerous snowpack out there. And recognize when you drop out of gates out west, you're gonna enter pretty serious avalanche terrain and a lot of accidents happen here. Do I, am I recommending don't do it? No, I'm recommending if you do it, make sure you're prepared. Have your gear, have the forecast, get an avalanche course and make sure you know what type of snowpack you're dropping into. And if the avalanche problem is persistent slab or deep persistent slab, just walk away from the gate. With that, I will open it up to questions and I hope you enjoyed this. I hope if you go out of gates that you ride safe, do what I've said here, and that'll keep you alive. Al, thanks a ton. That was an excellent presentation. Um, your, your talk is very timely, um, obviously with the tragic loss of a local skier couple of days ago. And as somebody pointed out in the chat as well, um, just like your example on the Gates of Vale, um, looks like there was uh, somebody killed uh, outside the Gates of Vale today. So uh, tragic loss, but a timely example of uh, things that can happen. And as somebody who skis out west quite a bit, um, it's really enticing to see a gate and say, oh, I've got a ticket. It's kind of like riding the subway and um, it's going to be good. And you can just go through that gate. 
um, but it's really important to remember where there's control in the um, in the ski area and where, and where there's not. And uh, that's not always super evident if you're not looking hard for it. So we do have a couple of really good questions. I, I would strongly encourage you to um, ask a question in the Q&A box. Um, Al is a advantage of that and we can do live questions as well. So if you raise a hand, we, we're happy to bring you on to ask this one for you here, Al. Um, let's see, what are the biggest things to look out for for av avalanche education on the West Coast and are now looking at East Coast terrain and conditions? Complex avalanche terrain. So the way I tend to look at and talk about East Coast, you know, it's really, it's East Coast big mountain skiing. Even though we don't have that altitude and things like that, it's big mountain skiing here. Um, the minute you pop into Tuckerman Ravine or Huntington Ravine, that's complex avalanche terrain. What I mean by that is there's overlapping avalanche paths. There's multiple start zones that you're exposed to. There's a lot of terrain traps. There's all kinds of hazards. And, and you go from zero to a hundred with a few steps, all right? So that's number one is to realize you're in complex avalanche terrain. A key thing about complex avalanche terrain is you are committed. You're, there's really no place to kind of get protection, you know, versus challenging or even simple avalanche terrain. So that's number one. Number two, we're a low probability, high consequence region, all right? Everything we ski here are steep couloirs or as Americans often call them, chutes, all right? No, everything here is rock lined, everything is rock riddled, and it's all really steep. You know, it's way steeper than terrain you find a lot of places. The next is when I say it's low probability, high consequence. We ski a lot of pencil hard wind slab here because we're home of the biggest wind of the world. And what that gives us is a high cohesion snowpack. But if you hit the sweet spot, you're in a lot of trouble. Nobody dies of asphyxiation in the presidential ranges, typically. It's typically trauma from smashing on rocks and things. So that's what I would look for. I'd also, I'm a big believer when I move to new terrain, and this takes patience and time, is go ski that terrain initially in the spring. The reason I say that is, I like to deal with a single, simple, predictable avalanche problem, like loose, wet avalanches. I just need to be there ahead of the sun, hammering the terrain, all right? I don't have to ask myself, am I gonna hit the thin spot of a pencil hard wind slab? And is that gonna step down in, in cliff ridden shoots? I can go attack that terrain, understand it very well in a loose wet avalanche situation and then come back and powder ski it the next year. So that would kind of be my recommendation for a Westerner moving east. Correct tools for assessing each avalanche problem, all right? Well, right now we have wind slab in the presidential range. So what's interesting today is, is and yesterday, and really for numerous days, we've kind of had, we've had storms, but we've also had the dew point kind of matching the temperature up high, which has led to zero visibility. So today I was on the west side, and what was interesting about it was there was no vis above 4,000 feet. So wind slab is this problem that we need to see really to recognize. We need to see if we're on it or not on it. So without vis, wind, wind slab is a pretty hard tool to deal with, all right? So I need visibility to deal with wind slab. I do a lot of hand shears. I'm looking at how clean it's breaking from my hand shear on a informal type of test, all right? So that's a tool that I use for that. Persistent slab, that's the easiest tool out there. Persistent slab avalanches aren't manageable, all right? The CAIC went into a huge report on this after the Sheep Creek avalanche. 
And that's the whole concept. You can manage wind slab. Stay off of where the wind slab is. Go to another aspect. Persistent slab's unmanageable. So don't manage that at all. Don't try to, just go ski somewhere else. Loose wet avalanche, pretty simple, all right? If it rained overnight, go to brunch. If it froze up overnight, get out there before too much solar gets on it, all right? And so those are kind of how I handle wet, loose wet. Wet slab is gonna be, there's already wind slabs. Now there's gonna be a major warming or there's gonna be a rain on snow event. It's a hard avalanche to mess with. And anytime you get into wet slab, they're unpredictable forecasters will tell you. So again, one I try to just stay away from. Loose dry avalanche. Um, from a skier's perspective, loose dry avalanches aren't slabs, they're not cohesive. And many of you have probably kicked them off on powder days, especially out west. The problem with a loose dry avalanche for you is if you get entrained in your slough, then it's gonna knock you off your feet. If that's in a bowl, kind of no, not a, a huge deal. If that's in steep terrain with rocks, cliffs, trees, gullies, or a stream below you, then all of a sudden a loose dry avalanche is a little bigger deal. If you're skiing that terrain and it's happening, take a look at a TGR video, and really you're dealing with slough management often a process called five and fade. Take five turns in the fall line, fade left or right if you can, so your slough doesn't pick up and knock you off your feet. So I hope that kind of answers your question. Um, the next one I see is how much avalanche terrain do you find in the Adirondacks? Uh, if I could just pop another speaker in right now, I'd have Drew Haas come in here and talk about his slide guide, all right? And, and what you'll see is there's a lot of heavy terrain in the Adirondacks. There's no forecasting. It's all rock slides. Rocks are notorious for faceting the snowpack. And, and so the ads have pretty tricky avalanche terrain with no forecast and zero protection. For an Adirondack skier, you know that bushwhacking up next to the slide it will be a pretty frustrating experience due to how deep the snow, it, it deep those trees are. So the problem with that Adirondack skiing is you got to pump, pump right up the gut. Can I talk about the Amanusik avalanche that happened this week? I actually, there's not a lot of information on it right now that's been released to the public as the investigation is still going on. What I did notice was the skier was buried 13 feet deep. So they were in a huge terrain trap, an area where all of the avalanche debris can build up and bury you very deep, all right? So that's really all I know. I think for Sandy, more information will come out later in the week as everybody finishes their investigation. James, when skiing out of the gates out west, should you dig a pit even on a low day to understand the immediate snowpack or trust the forecast? It's a great question, James. The first thing you have to do is recognize digging pits is a craft that you need a lot of practice at. I know Pat can tell you that from his level three. They exam you out of control. You run a lot of pits. So if you don't build good pits, then your date is a little questionable. So you need to be really good at that craft. Also, pits are never used to ski a line. Pits are used to show us that we shouldn't ski. So then we'll back up to what you're talking about and trust the forecast. Again, it depends on what kind of avalanche problem I'm dealing with. Right now, the whole country is experiencing persistent weak layers. All right. And, and so again, as I said, that's not an and an avalanche problem, I bother managing. I just ski somewhere else, a different aspect or, at, or just in the ski area or just low angle terrain because it's such a dangerous problem. Brett, can you talk about avalanche issues on Katahdin? Katahdin is one of those really unknown spots for us overall. Katahdin avalanches all the time. 
It's also like the presidentials. It gets high winds, and that high winds leads to a very much a pencil hard wind slab with a low probability but high consequence. The thing to recognize about going into Katahdin is it's a long trek. And when you get in there, you need to be prepared with getting skunked. I've been on there on a few different occasions where there just wasn't really much skiing because of winds and avalanche and, and, and perceived avalanche danger, as well as how deep you are in the terrain. Katahdin's a really remote place. And so you wanna be careful in super remote places because you're kind of your only, um, you're gonna rescue you really. Uh, is there good information out there about terrain traps in the east or is that mainly gathered for observation in classes? That's gathered from observation in classes. Terrain traps are not things that show up on maps, all right? It's part of what's called micro terrain management. And often terrain traps can happen within the 40 foot contour lines on your topo map. So I would go out and look at the terrain and, uh, and I would take an avalanche class or talk to a local guide service. Low vis situation. How do you find wind slab problems? Or should you just stay at home when you see this situation? What I do in that situation, James, is I have a big catalog and that catalog is a mix of low or simple avalanche terrain, challenging avalanche terrain, like golf of slides, defined paths where I can recognize terrain features and then complex avalanche terrain. In low visibility situations, I try not to get, I'm, I'm pretty exposed dealing with wind slab. So I try not to be in a wind slab situation in a low, in, when it's low vis. I'll find some better skiing elsewhere. After spending a lot of time in the MRV, have you ever seen a slide in that area? If so, where did it occur and what kinds of wind directions can load this terrain? So if you think like really the big terrain in MRV is right off the Heaven's Gate lift, which is called the church. It's a series of cliffs that are maybe a 10 minute hike off the gate. That's really the only place where you're gonna get much avalanching. And typically I've only actually seen one small slide in there, all right? So that would be, you're basically getting the predominant wind direction is coming out of the west that hits the Mad River Valley. Oh boy, that's a tough question. What are your thoughts on skiing alone? If you do, what scenarios do you consider or for go, no go decision making? Do you some, carry something like a garment in reach when in the back country? So you're asking a pretty tough question, um, but in all transparency, um, tr skiing alone is dangerous. That's all there is to it. We've had avalanche fatalities here uh, with skiers skiing alone. Every instructor would tell you not to do it. Most guides would tell you not to do it, but they're also are doing it. So it, as someone who te who's on the area instructor team, I had a, a instructor taking a continuing, educa a, ugh, continuing education course from me this year. And, and that instructor said, he vowed five years ago to not lie to his students. So I'll answer the question in total transparency. Yes, I ski alone. Do I think it's risky? Oh, yes, I do. Why do I do it? One, I've had the flexibility for the last decade or so to see windows. And because I live about 75 minutes from the Pinkham Notch Trailhead, I'll literally, I watch the weather constantly and I see windows to go ski terrain, all right? My go, no go decision. If I'm going powder skiing and I'm skiing alone, it's already a high risk situation. So what am I looking at there? I'm watching that storm every bit of the way. I'm watching the winds for the storm. I'm using my own um, experience with the terrain and being in there a lot. So I know the terrain that I'll go to 
and I'm looking at what the storm's doing. Is the storm coming in wet, finishing dry, right side up? Is the storm starting dry, finishing wet, upside down, with a lot of storm slab? Do I carry an inReach? You bet I do. I carry my inReach when I go alone. I carry my jet oil when I go alone. I carry my bivy bag when I go alone. I carry a half bag when I go alone. I'm preparing myself to spend the night. Not so much because of being caught in an avalanche, but just an injury, all right? When I ski alone, I'm trying to ski within reason conservatively. That does not mean not skiing big terrain, but it's skiing that terrain in a conservative fashion, prepared for issues. I have quote unquote a float plan. Different people know that I'm out. Um, Often, if my wife wants to, she can follow my what's going on on my inReach. So yes, I use those types of, of devices. What do the whites have? Why do the whites have any simple avalanche terrain? They would have gladed terrain. So you know, there's a lot of stashes out there. Bald face is an area that it would be in some respects you know, borders on, on simple avalanche terrain. Um, but there's a lot of good terrain to go ski, glades skiing, that when you don't understand what's going on, go to GBA's glades or, or go over to Rasta's glades. You'll get some great skiing in there. Remember, a great J-Day will, will just be up there with any kind of, of day. So, you know, like on those, those questionable days, find some good fun terrain to ski where the snow's good. We are lucky in some ways here that the forecast area is so small, it can be very specific. How do you suggest managing something like the Tetons where the forecast area is so large, more in terms of course of understanding avoiding areas which have been under forecasted balanced with the traditional using, not using pits to go versus using them to avoid. Um, so the game of managing terrain in a big forecast area is, it, is the classic, I think, that's coming up this Sunday. So it, if I think about student of the game, and I'm not a Pats fan, that's Tom Brady, all right? He seems to know everything about every team, about every defense, et cetera. And, and here he is, he leaves the Pats and he's in the Super Bowl, no problem. So how do you become a student of the game for that? Go to the forecast center look at the observations and find weather stations. Typically what I'll do is I will plot various, I'll pull up Google Earth so I can understand the actual slope topography of the line I wanna ski. Then I'll start pulling up weather stations that kind of blanket that area so I can really look at what's going on from a weather standpoint. Then I go blog hunting. Uh, um, the Tetons is actually an area I don't spend much time in, but like when I'm in the Pacific Northwest, turns all year is a fantastic blog. It's a it's skiers talking about terrain they're skiing. It's not really too uh, bullyish. It's it's a good site. So I'm looking for things like that. So I'm matching weather stations. I'm looking at forecast observations. I'm looking at skier observations and I'm pinpointing it to my specific slope and where my slope is within that mountain range. Is it on the leading ed edge? Is it on the trailing edge? Is it a north facing aspect, eastern aspect, shaded cold, southern aspect, western aspect, more sun? All right, so I hope that answers your question. You bet, Brian. Is climate change having a direct effect on the dangers of avalanche conditions? Yes. Um, do I have data on that? It, it's all anecdotal, really. It's just how I've seen regions that I go to all the time change. And then the concept of this line never slides. So that's no name Cirque, which is a giant spot out of Berthoud Pass. And there's a rib on no name. That, that many birthed skiers have told you has never slid. Has it slid? Who knows? Do I expect no name to slide in the future? I do. Avalanches when I first went to Japan were not very common. 
Then all of a sudden I started seeing things in Japan I'd never seen before, like the sun. Like if you go to Japan and ski in Japanuary, it'll snow every day. And so you never see sun or you never see stars. Then all of a sudden I started to see some sun. That sun created sun crust and warming and created then touchy bed surfaces on places that really never avalanched and personnel that really never dealt with avalanches. So climate change is impacting Iceland quite a bit. So yeah, climate change is gonna raise the avalanche danger for sure because it's gonna create more um, thinner snowpack. It's just gonna create more crazy weather events. And so yes, it's, gonna, it's impacting the avalanche danger. So that is the last question I'm seeing. So if anybody else has one. Oh, okay, James, first of all, thanks so much for answering all the questions, no problem. Um, this is great. My fiance and I are planning on backcountry skiing outside of Bariloche, Argentina next year with a company called Malin Alto. Have you ever heard of them? No. Skied the area? No. Seen any crazy every problems in the area? No. Am I dying to ski the area? I am. I can't wait. In fact, there's a hut there, and there might be somebody who's on this uh, webcast who's a speaker here who's spent a little time at that hut, and that's the Frey Hut. And it is so on my list. But my view of it is I need three weeks down there because I need to first nail some ski legs, um, and then I need to get into the terrain, etc. So there's a guide called I think your Kozel, all right? And uh, I'll make sure that I send Pat the link, who's an IFMGA guide in that area. That's certainly who I'd be looking for. When you go out with guides, um, go out with an AMGA trained guide, go out with an IFMGA guide, because you're gonna get a certain standard of, of guide that is internationally certified and internationally accepted, they'll be at the highest standards. So if Malin Alto does not use IFMGA guides, then I would not personally use them. I hope that answers your question, James. Make sure you shoot us pictures of Berlioche and all that terrain because I can't wait to get there. I think that's awesome. all. Well that looks like it, Al. That was an amazing presentation. Nice work. Um, thank you. You have time oh. for one more, Al? Can you talk about Can how you talk a little bit? Of Can you talk a bit about how sun affects a snowpack? Maritime snowpack stabilize more quickly. Would a southern face stabilize more quickly because the sun will warm the snowpack? So first of all, sun affects the snow. The guy who can talk the most about that is Tomas Exner. Tomas is an IFMGA guide and a PhD from the University of Calgary, who luckily I ended up meeting uh, at a hut once. Um, he actually has a really cool uh, spreadsheet called Swarm out there. But essentially, when you think about solar, solar runs down about 20 centimeters deep, all right? And so solar is really impacting it pretty heavily. Um, for maritime snowpacks stabilize, they stabilize more quickly because of the weight of the snow, the density of the snow, and the fact that persistent grains are typically not common there. So would a southern face stabilize more quickly because the sun will warm it? Sun always is advent, in the end is advantageous, all right? But as the thing that, that snow doesn't like is snow doesn't like big stresses. So when solar first gets on things, stay away from it because it won't be feeling that warmth right away. And that warmth will start to really change things quite a bit. We could get into the chemical engineering of it, like how 10 degrees C doubles the reaction rate. But basically, you know, let those faces stabilize a few days afterwards. Do not get out there, like when the storm goes away and the sun comes out, that's really what Tomas's work was about in BC. And it was the Canadian Avalanche Association was dropping the danger rating as soon as it went bluebird. And yet there were big D3 avalanches going on. 
So that was really what prompted his research. And so I would say that be careful right when solar gets on something. So as a younger skier who has a decent amount of backcountry experience, what is the best way to find people or groups to ride who are more experienced and, and can help me learn? So really what you're looking for, Kara, is you're looking for a mentor, all right? And, and so mentors are things that we as skiers need to go find, all right? So the first thing I might do is I might pop over to one of the guide companies and see if you can help them out on an avalanche course and pal around with them. That would be the first way because you're really looking for a big mentor to start with and versus having some group that says, hi, I'm the most experienced group on the mountain and you should just hang with me. So go out with one of the one of the guiding companies and help on an avalanche course, and you'll start to meet them, and you may be able to tag around with them. Alex, I'm a senior in high school looking to snowboard Tuckerman in the spring with my dad. This will be our first time skiing the Prezies. Would you recommend getting a guide or will checking the forecast in Avalanche Bulletin be enough? I totally get a guide. I, the, what, when you get a guide, you're getting a lot more than someone to safely take you out in the terrain. You're getting years and years of information. Guides hire guides. So I definitely get a guide. Do you need a guide to do it? Oh, no. Will you learn so much more with a guide? Oh, my God, yes. All right. Get a guide. Enjoy the trip with your dad. Let the guide do the thinking. You guys do the question and learning and, and you'll have one of the best days also. Also, that guide's gonna tell you, hey, this is a terrible window that you picked. You decided on Sunday, the 9th of April and, and we just had a rainer and it froze solid. It's not gonna get above 30 today. It's gonna be scratchy and, and, and long sliding falls are in the cards, all right? So get a guide, you'll have more fun. Okay. All right. Nice. Shout out to the high schoolers who are watching this. Um, kudos it. to you for, for coming here and uh, taking charge of your own education. So keep, keep it up um, and uh, kudos to you. If you are uh, really enjoying this and get a lot of, out of this presentation from Al, um, we do have some more uh, of these speaker series coming up. Al is doing another one later in the year. Um, I'm doing one and we have a few more scheduled. Check them out on the uh, Mount Washington Avalanche Center uh, website and you can see the calendar of events uh, on there. And we are recording these talks and putting them up on the Mount Washington Avalanche Center YouTube channel. So I'd really encourage you to um, check out not only the other talks, but you know, Al, Al talked about a lot of different topics in this presentation and it, it you might learn something if you went back over it and and maybe uh, for round might have missed on the, on the first go around. So definitely check that out. Um, keep, keep, keep us posted on the, uh, on the Instagram and Facebook. We'll, we'll, be, keep, we'll be updating all of, all of the events that we'll have going on there.